Good morning. I don't believe in coincidences. And this morning we've been singing songs about faith and the power of Jesus' name. And God lined up my message so perfectly with the music service this morning because my message is on faith. We are going through a time right now as a church. We're going through a time as a country. We're going through a time as a world where our faith is being tested. How we respond to that faith, how we respond to those trials, how we respond to those tribulations, thank you, is ultimately up to us. But God's Word gives us some examples of some great people that responded to adversity. And this morning, my message is back in the book of Hebrews. I read through Hebrews chapter 11 last week. I read through verses 1 through 39. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 12, verse 1 this morning. But I'm going to use a lot of Hebrews chapter 11 because there's some great examples of people that were faithful to God and faithful to His mission. And today, this morning, that is what we need. We need Christians that are faithful to His mission, faithful to the work of His kingdom. I pray that we as the church do what God has called us to do, and that is to be on fire. Not let the problems of the world or the problems of the nation or the problems within the church affect our service to the church. And so this morning, that's where I'm at. That's where God's led me all week is where are we at in our faith? Today is the day to take action. Today is the day to show that faith. So... Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. This morning, I'm asking you. I'm asking each of you individually. Are you letting the burdens of the world, are you letting the sin that has come into your life affect your service to God? Are you allowing the sin that has come into your life and the problems that you're facing, the trials and the tribulations, are you letting those things affect your service to God? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, tells us to forget those things and to run the race of endurance. This morning, that's what I want to do. This week, that's what I want to do. I want to take what God has given me through His Word, and I want to run the race. This past week, I've let the things of my life trip me up, and today's the day I say no. Today's the day that I look God in the face And I say, God, I am going to be faithful to you. And I am going to run the race that you have called me to run. This morning, are each of you willing to run the race that God has called you to run? The first thing we have to do is to throw the things aside that trip us up. Go to verse 2, please. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary. 
and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. I read a verse this morning in my devotions, and it was no accident that God put this verse right before my eyes as I was doing my devotions. It was John chapter 16, verse 33. I did not give that to you, Casey, so don't try to pull it up. I'm just going to read it. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, folks. In the church this morning, let's be of good cheer. Let's rejoice at what God has done for us. And let's be faithful in our service to Him. How can we run with endurance the race that God has set before us? We have to focus on Jesus. We have to focus on Him. We have to focus on His ways. We have to focus on His desires. That's where the world gets trapped. That's where the church gets trapped. That's where people get trapped. We want to pursue our own plans. We want to pursue our own desires. But when we pursue our own things, when we pursue our own desires, when we pursue what we want, that's not helping the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, we have to reflect on what God desires. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And I want to share those verses with you all this morning. Can you put Matthew 14 up, please? Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take Courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Once again, when Peter focused on Jesus, when he focused his eyes on Jesus, he was able to, to walk on the water. He was able to avoid seeing the the wind and the waves that surrounded him. But when he lost that focus and when he no longer focused his eyes on Jesus, he saw the storms and he saw those things and it affected his ability to walk on the water. Your trials, your tribulations that you're facing today. The trials, the tribulations the church is facing. The trials, the tribulations that the United States and the world is facing. Can you imagine what would happen if we simply focused on Jesus? Can you imagine the storms that we could defeat if we actually focused on Jesus? Can you imagine what we can do as a church if we truly focused on Jesus and what he desires for us to do? And that was my high tenor voice. You're probably going to get a lot of that this morning. That's why I don't get up and sing. I sound horrible. When Peter focused on Jesus, he could walk on the water. 
When he lost Jesus and he lost his focus, he sunk. That same thing happens to us today. We have to maintain our focus on Jesus. We have to pursue Jesus and his kingdom. We have to pursue God's desires and not our own. I don't want to serve God in a church. And I'm not saying grace. I'm saying the church nationwide, worldwide. I don't want to serve a church that's going to focus on man. It's going to focus on man's desires. I want to serve a God. And the only way for us to serve God is to allow Him to do what He desires to do through us. So let's stop putting limitations on God today and let's do what God is teaching us to do. Let's do what God's Word says that we need to do. And that requires each of us to stand up and to get on fire for God and to allow God to change us, allow God to mold us, allow God to make us into what we need to be. Are you willing to do that this morning? Peter was. The example of Christ, it should motivate us. And it it should encourage believers. Jesus, when you think of Jesus, you should get excited. I know when I think of Jesus, I get excited. As we were singing that song, the power of Jesus' name. That's powerful. Christ has done absolutely everything necessary for us to go on and endure and to persevere in our faith. Jesus did not focus on the cross. He didn't focus on the cross. He focused on what was going to happen after the cross. That's why God the Father sent him. He knew what his mission was. He knew that after he died on that cross that he was going to be resurrected from the dead. And did he agonize over that? As you read God's word, do you see anywhere where he agonized over it? The only only point where he may have agonized over it was in the Garden of Gethsemane right as he was praying. But his only words were, God, if there's some other way to do this, go about doing it. He focused on the reward. He focused on how his death was going to give salvation. And it was going to give hope. And it was going to give reward to millions and millions of people. When Jesus died on that cross, he was thinking of me and you. He wasn't thinking of himself. When we go through trials, when we go through tribulations, a lot of the times we sit there and give pity to ourselves. It's time we get out of the dirt. It's time we get out of the trench. And it's time we stand up and we pursue God. It's time we stop thinking about ourselves and it's time that we start thinking about Him and what He desires for us to do. Just as Jesus did. We should be motivated to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that is set before us. So now my outline starts. Definition of faith. Can you put Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 up there, okay, Casey? Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith begins, folks, by believing in God's character. And faith ends in believing in God's promises. We have faith that God sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us. And we have faith that as a result 
of that crucifixion on the cross and the resurrection. We live by faith through God's Word that tells us that that happened. Our faith, it's in a God who created the entire universe in six days. He spoke the creation into existence. Our faith is focused on a God that has amazing power. And God wants to do amazing things in your life. But you have to be willing to turn over yourself to Him. And allow Him to do what it is that He desires to do through you. This morning, are you allowing God to make you into what He desires for you to be? Do you have the faith that God is going to deliver you from the trial or the tribulation that you're facing today? If I stood up here on this stage and I told you that I didn't have trials and tribulations going on in my life, I am wrong, and that would be a flat-out lie. I have trials. I have tribulations that I'm facing this morning. In fact, I told Brother David before I got up here, pray for me. Satan is attacking me so hard. Satan does not want me to go up on that stage. Jesus does. That's why I'm here. Jesus called me here. I'm uncomfortable, yes. But every time I get up here, every time I serve God and whatever God desires for me to serve Him in, I want to be uncomfortable. Because when I become comfortable, that's when I start relying on myself. And serving God requires you to completely remove yourself. So why is faith important? We can see this in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. We've got to practice our faith in order to please God. So this morning, if you're dealing with a trial, if you're dealing with a tribulation in your life, are you trusting God? If God can defeat death, hell, and the grave. He can defeat the problems that you're facing this morning in your life. This morning I woke up after about a two-hour night's rest. But somehow or the other, I woke up excited. I woke up excited because I knew what God was going to do here this morning. You see, serving God Requires faith. And when you're faithful, it's amazing what He can do in your life. But you have to be willing to allow Him to transform you into what He desires to do through you. Faith shows that we are trusting in God and relying on Him instead of ourselves in our own ways. When you're exercising faith, you're not relying on yourself. When you're exercising faith, you are truly relying on God. You are truly relying on His character. You're truly relying on His promises. God wants us to rely on Him. As a church... As a country, now is the time to make that happen. Now is to turn the tide, turn away from all the sin that has, that has taken over the world, that has taken over the nation, that has taken over our government. It, you, you see it everywhere you look, you see sin. And the only reason that that's there is because of mankind. But yet, God made us perfect. God made Adam and Eve perfect in the garden. 
But just because you look out at the world, just because you look out at places and you see sin today, doesn't mean that that's the way that we have to live. I don't know about everybody in here this morning, but I'm excited because I want to change the mindset of it's okay. I want to change the mindset into it's not okay. It's not okay to sin. It's not okay to pursue what you want in your life. It is okay to pursue God. And it is okay to pursue the way that He calls us to live. And it is okay to pursue what He desires us to do for His kingdom. But if we don't remove self, and we don't truly rely on God, and we don't truly rely on His ways and His Word, nothing will change. I want to serve a church that's excited and on fire for God. That's what God's word calls us to calls that's how God calls us to serve him. God wants our faith to lead to a personal relationship with him. Our faith leads to a personal relationship with him when you confess him, your sins and you confess him as your Lord and Savior. You create a personal relationship with him. My prayer is that each person in this building this morning has that personal relationship with God. But if you do not have that personal relationship with God, today is the day to make that happen. It will be the best experience you've ever faced in your life. It won't be the easiest, in fact. <laughs> right now, in, in my service to God... It's one of the most difficult times I've ever been in in my walk. But yet I'm excited. Because I know it's in God's hands. And I know God is capable of doing amazing things. If he can create the world in six days, he can change man. But we have to be willing to give ourselves up. Can you put 2 Corinthians 6 verses 1 and 2 up, Casey, please. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. God doesn't look at what you've done in your past. God doesn't care about what you've done in your past. He wants you to confess those sins to Him. And He wants to change you. And He wants you to learn from those mistakes that you've made in your past. But He doesn't hold those things against you like man today holds those things against us. Today, we need to break the chains. And the only way to break the chains is by allowing God to come in and transform us. Again, that requires faith. You can't see Jesus, but my God tells me through his word that he is a chain breaker. And I've seen him break a lot of chains. I've seen him break a lot of chains. And it gets me excited. And it should get you excited. It should get the church excited. We should, we should be out there preaching the message of Jesus, the chain breaker. Instead of those churches that choose to refuse to allow a certain type of man into their church, we should be allowing everybody to come into the church. That was one of the most exciting moments. Believe it or not, it was one of the most exciting moments when I had the opportunity to go into the prison here in Jefferson County. A lot of ministries, a lot of church ministries, don't want to go into the jail they don't want to go in and break those chains and I don't understand that now is the time that they're in the prison to change to, to help preach that message of Jesus Christ to show that there's hope to show that God can break the chains God assures us that all who honestly seek him all who act in faith on the knowledge of God, will be rewarded and will receive salvation. That should get us excited. 
What does faith look like in a person's life? And this is where I get excited because he just gave us the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And I look at all of those individuals, and I'm just going to share some of them. Can you pull up Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, please? It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Cain offered an offering of his crops. Abel offered the firstborn, the strongest firstborn lambs of his flock. But most importantly, Abel offered his offering. He offered his best. Cain, Cain's offering was, I'll just give him this. As a result, look at Abel's faith. This morning, I'm asking you, are you offering your life as Cain? Or are you offering your life as Abel? God wants us all in. God wants us all in. He doesn't want just part of us. He wants us all in. And He wants us serving Him. And He wants us serving His kingdom with excitement. Today, we need to be more like Abel. Cain killed Abel because Cain was jealous. We should be out there in the world. The world should be jealous of us. They should want what we have. But too often, too much, we're not being the Christians that God has called us to be. And I've heard it said to me, and I know it's been said to others in this, in this sanctuary this morning. I know it's been said. Why would I want God when I look at the church and I see what's taking place? That should hurt us. That should kill us to the very ends of our soul. That should convict us. That should convict us to change. The world should look in the doors of the church and say, My God, I want that. Where are you at in your life this morning? He also gives us an example of Noah. 11 verse 7, please. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Here God had called Noah to build an ark in the middle of dry land. People looked at Noah like he was dumb, like he was stupid. God had spoke to Noah. God had told Noah what was going to happen. Noah was obedient to what God was calling him to do. And as a result, Noah received God's righteousness. That could not have been made possible without faith. Noah had faith that God was going to have a flood and that there was going to be the need for the ark. He couldn't see it when God told him. In fact, he was in the middle of dry land, way inland. Can you imagine in somebody living in Oklahoma or Kansas, some parts of the flattest part of the country, and say you were told, I'm going to flood the entire earth, you need to build an ark. What would you do? People would look at you like you're really stupid. But if God's calling you to do something in your life, you better not look at it as being stupid. You better look at it as this is a time for me to be obedient because God needs me. This is a time where God is going to do something great. I remember when we were purchasing the five acres next door. 
we put out a challenge because God had showed us that he was going to raise the money for that without going to going for a loan. And we put out what God had called them, what had God had told us. And that was we're going to raise this in 90 days. We could have got scared. We could have said no. Or we could have been obedient. We chose to be obedient to what God was calling us to do. And the church chose to be obedient to what God called us to do. And today we own that five acres next door. That's what being obedient to God will do. That's what exercising faith will do. Exercising faith will move mountains, as you said, Sam. God can move mountains that man can't move. And God's moving those mountains every single day. We choose not to open our eyes and see the mountains that He's moving every day, but He is moving those mountains as we speak. Can you put up 11, verse 8, please? It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. I gave this example last week. Abraham was willing to give up everything that he had to follow God. He was willing to leave a land of he was willing to leave the land of Ur to go to a place that he had no idea where he was going. But he knew that God was calling him to do it and he got up and he did it. This morning, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Are you willing to pick up everything that you have and go where God has you go? Are you willing to Put down everything and allow God to mold you and make you into the calling that he's calling you to. Are you saying, no, God, I can't do this. It's too big. Too big of a challenge. God can move mountains. He can change you. He's changed me. He can do it to you. Are you willing to pick, up it, to pick up everything and do what God has called you to do just like Abraham was willing to pick up and allow God to use him. 11.11, 11, please. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and was too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. Sarah was faithful that she's going to have a child. Even in her barren age, yes, there were problems along the way, but even in her barren age, she realized and she exercised faith that God was going to give her a child. And that God eventually gave her Isaac. The world would have looked at Sarah and said, that's impossible. You can't bear a child at that age. Again, we serve a God that can do anything He desires to do. We serve a God that can change people. We serve a God that can change this country. We serve a God that can change this church. He can change the world, but we have to be willing to pick up our feet and to exercise that faith. God gave me this quote. God makes the impossible possible. But we have to have the faith that God can make the impossible possible. God makes the impossible possible. But we must have the faith that God can make the impossible possible. Do you have the faith that God can make the impossible possible in your life this morning? Because he can. Can you put up 11 verses 17 through 19 please? It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. 
Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Abraham was willing to give up the promised son that God had promised to give Sarah. Trusting that God was going to raise him up. Abraham even took Isaac up on top of the mountain and was coming down to kill him, to slain him. And God said no. God said no. That example should be an example to us this morning that God does test us. God desires for us to rely on Him. The situation that you're going through this morning in your life, whether it be losing a job, whether it be a marriage issue, whether it be financial issues, whatever the issue may, may be, God didn't put you in that position to be mean to you. God allowed that He allowed that situation to come up in your life to show you that He desires you to rely on Him and to show you that He can move mountains and to show you that miracles can happen. But you have to have that faith that it's going to happen. You have to have faith that God can come into the situation that you're facing in life that you feel as though is leading to death. God can change that to being born again. Abraham was willing to give up everything for God. Abraham received more than he had ever imagined in return. And he, got, and he gave Abraham a whole nation of descendants through Isaac, just as he promised. Did Abraham see, did Abraham live to see all those things? No. A lot of the times, we don't live to see the end result. I may not I may not live to see the results of things that God is going to do in my life. But God's word tells me. God's word tells me that he's going to keep his promise. So whatever situation that I'm going through in my life today, I'm seeking God. I'm asking him for the answers. And I know whatever those answers whatever those answers are. God has a greater plan. And God's plan is greater than mine. Can we can you pull up 11 verse 20 please? It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons Jacob and Esau. As you see here Isaac blessed his sons, and he exhorted them to obey the covenant. Jacob, likewise, reminded his sons of God's promises, as we can see in 11 verse 21. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Joseph expressed his confidence that God would bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Do you have that confidence this morning? That God is going to deliver you from the trials, the tribulations that you're facing? Do you truly, truly have the faith and the confidence that that's going to happen? 
God's Word says that if we have faith, a grain of a mustard seed, how does it go, Diane? Say again. We can move mountains. In 11 verse 22 when you look at the story of when you look at the story of Joseph in Genesis Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery and then he was later sold again to the pharaoh of Egypt In fact Joseph was given a top-ranking position in Pharaoh's government. Now, Joseph, he could have used that position for his benefit. He could have sought revenge against his brothers who sold him into slavery. But what did Joseph do? Eventually, Joseph brought his brothers into Egypt to live next to him. He kept them safe from a famine. He didn't seek revenge for revenge. He didn't become bitter with his brothers. Instead, he responded in a way that God calls us to respond. Respond with God's glory. Respond with God's kindness. We can take an example from that. Joseph could have used his position for his personal dreams, but instead he was focused on God's promise to Abraham. He had faith that God was going to fulfill the covenant that he had made with Abraham. As a result, he reconciled with his brothers, brought them close to Egypt, and he even asked for his bones to be delivered to the promised man promised land when they were freed from slavery. You look at another example that we can see here in 11, verse 23. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Moses' parents refused to carry out the command of Pharaoh to kill their child. And as a result, Moses became one of Israel's greatest leaders. A prophet and the person that God used to give the law. When Moses was born, the Hebrew children were in slavery in Egypt. And the Egyptian government had ordered all the Hebrew babies to be killed. But Moses was spared, and he was raised by Pharaoh's own daughter. Now, this goes back to the example that we saw in in Joseph. Moses turned his back on the passing pleasures that could have been the result of serving in the position that he served in in Pharaoh's government. He could have had it made very well. He could have done very well in regards to material possessions if that's what he would have chosen to do. But he wasn't focused on material possessions. Moses was focused on God's plan. Moses was focused on fulfilling God's plan. So Moses gave up those things, and Moses accepted the call to lead the Israelites out of the land of Egypt out of slavery. And as a result, Moses saw many miracles take place. He grew in his faith. You see in 11 verse 30, where the Israelites led by Joshua, they trusted God to give them victory. Can you put that verse up, please? 
It's already up there. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. And you see in 11 verse 31, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Here, Rahab was a Gentile, but Rahab was also a prostitute. As a result of Rahab's faith, she welcomed the spies into her home, and she trusted God to spare her and her family when Jericho was destroyed. She exercised faith. You look at other examples. You see Daniel. Daniel's one of my favorite Old Testament prophets. You see that Daniel was unwilling to back down from his belief in God. He was unwilling to back down in his faith. And as a result, he was put into a den of lions because he chose not to bow down to the statues of the Babylonian Empire. And as a result, he was put into that den of lions. And what we all know what happened in the den of lions. He lived through it. Then he was even offered to, to be in a high position within the, within the Babylonian Empire. You look at Shadrach, you look at Meshach and Abednego, another one of my favorite stories. They were willing to refuse to bow down to the Babylonian Empire. They were refusing to the consents and the decrees of the Babylonian Empire. And as a result, they were put into the fiery furnace. And we see what happened in the fiery furnace. They lived through it. You see, God can take situations that we think are absolutely impossible. And He can make the best case scenarios in those situations. He can make the best of our trials. He can make the best of our tribulations. But we have to be willing to have the faith. We have to be willing to refuse to bow down to the world. This morning, I challenge us as a church, we have to bow down from the world. Now is the time to cast the world out of the church and get Jesus in the church. But to keep Jesus in the church is going to require faith. To keep the world out in the world is going to require faith. To go out and serve in the world, it's going to require faith. And that's what we're called to do. We have to get outside of the walls of the church. We have to have faith that God can use us. Even when we don't think He can use us, He can. Do you have that faith this morning? Is your faith in Jesus? Or is your faith in the world? My faith is in Jesus this morning. My word, God's word tells me that I have a home waiting for me in heaven. My, God's word tells me that the trials and the tribulations that I face today are only temporary in nature. They're going to grow me. They're going to make me. They're going to mold me into what I need to be. But I have to be willing to rely more upon Him. As the church, we have to be willing to rely more upon Him this morning. In your personal life, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in the temporary world? Or is it in the eternal Jesus? My prayer is that it's an eternal Jesus. So what happens to the faithful? What happened to these individuals that we just read about in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11? 
Number one, some of the faithful died without seeing God's promises. All of these people died still believing what God had promised them. Yet they didn't see the, they didn't see the actual promise. But they died believing that the promise was still there. So sometimes the faithful die without seeing God's promises. We see the promise from a distance. I see God's promise from a distance. God's word tells me about the promise and I can see eternal life in my future because that's what God's word says I have. Number two, some found consolation, and so do we, in the truth that they will not realize the full blessings of God until they enter heaven. We will not receive the full blessings of God until we enter heaven. The good works that we do, we're receiving crowns every day. We do a good work. But we're not going to see all those blessings until God calls us home. Until we actually see Jesus standing in front of us. Number three, some experienced miraculous deliverance, as it is in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 33 through 35. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Number four, Others, despite their implicit trust in God, experienced torture, mockings, scourings, imprisonment, stonings, affliction, and torment. You can see this in 35 through 38. Can you put up verse 36, please? Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. As you can see, some of the faithful that we read about in the Hall of Faith, and us included, we're not always going to see the promises here upon this earth. We can read about them, and we have faith that they're going to happen, but we don't always see the end result. Some of us, we've seen miraculous divine intervention. And some of us have experienced that torture, mocking, imprisonment, stonings, destitution, etc., When we are faithful, God is faithful. Christians are to demonstrate obedience to God in suffering. Obedience through our trials, obedience through our tribulations by being patiently endurant. I don't know about everybody else here, but one of the things that I fear the most is being patient, waiting on God. Sometimes I'm like, God, would you hurry this up? I'm getting kind of anxious. God's timing is best. If you're here this morning and you're dealing with the trial, if you're dealing with the tribulation, 
God didn't put you there to be mean. God's allowing that to happen. To mold you. To make you. Into what you need to be. Are you being faithful? Are you being faithful in God? Trusting in God? Pursuing God? That's my prayer this morning. Is that each of us are willing to stand up and to be faithful to what it is that God is calling us to do. In order to be faithful and do what it is that God's calling us to do, we have to turn away from what we desire. We have to turn away from what we think's best. And we have to focus on God and seek what He desires. Where are you at in your life this morning? I'm going to ask David to come up and lead us in a song of invitation. I'm going to ask Sam to come up, please. I know this is unexpected, but... God wants to move. God wants to see examples of faith. He wants to see us Being faithful. He wants us to sacrifice ourselves to allow Him to come in and do what He desires. This morning, I'm not going to ask you that. I'm asking you. Where are you at in your relationship with Christ? Are you allowing Him to do what it is that He desires to do through you? Or are you refusing To give up. Today is the day to allow God to change you. Today is the day to stand up and to say, I'm going to be faithful to what God desires for me to do. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing in as well. And when I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Let us close in a word of prayer this morning. Our Father, we just thank you so much for this day and this time that you've given us to come together in your presence and to give you glory, to give you worship. Lord, I do need you every hour of every day. Lord, we thank you for the words that you've spoken this morning. I just pray that each of us in here would truly take what we have learned here today and make improvement in our faith, that we exercise our faith, that we truly believe, knowing your promises, knowing that you are there, knowing that you are leading, knowing that you're directing and guiding and knowing that you're there for every circumstance, whether it be good or bad in our lives, we thank you for being the almighty God that you are. We thank you for loving us enough to send your only son to die for us upon that cross and to be resurrected so that we can celebrate hope and so that we can celebrate eternal life this morning. I pray that each of us would celebrate that eternal life, would celebrate that eternal hope this week with power pray that each of us would go out into the world this week and to proclaim Jesus and to proclaim Jesus in a way that shows how excited we are to serve him how excited we are to have that personal relationship with him Father we do love you and we praise you it's in Jesus name that I pray Amen